Hey guys, welcome to another edition of The Bridge HC Online. I am the lead pastor, Larry Vinson, uh, and I want to talk about being prepared today because, you know, we like to feel prepared for the journeys that we face, don't we? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but whenever I go on a trip somewhere and I know I forgot something, until I have that something, I, I'm going to feel lost. I'm going to feel like I'm not... Uh, that I'm not with it, that I'm not going to be able to relax. Like if I forget a charger at home, which happens quite a bit, uh, you know, until I go out to the store and buy another charger for the, you know, the time that I need it, I'm going to feel like I, I am not complete, right? Not because I'm tied to my phone like that, but just because I need everything, um, you know, that to, uh, to feel prepared. I need the things that I need, right? That's why we have the things that we need. But here's a harsh reality that I think we need to come to terms with. You know, many people are not ready for the rough road that comes as a result of following Jesus, nor are they ready for the length of the journey, right? And you sit there and you're asking, well, okay, Larry, well, how do you know that? Well, for me, it boils down to how people see faith. In my experience, People view faith as an individual expression of belief. And again, you might be sitting there and you're thinking, well, yeah, that's how everybody sees faith, right? That's that's the definition of faith. It's an individual thing and it's an expression of someone's belief. But And it's not necessarily the worst thing ever, except though, when individualism is then translated to a faith that only takes care of the individual or those close to the individual. You know, it's like when somebody says, uh, you know, I'm just going to take care of me and my own, right? I, I've been burned so many times, hurt so many times, stabbed in the back so many times that I'm just going to care about me and my family and, and, and those close to me and that's it. So when it comes time to take care of others, especially uh, those who are the hardest to take care of, and off the top of my head, I'm thinking of people who are battling addiction, people um, who are struggling with homelessness, you know, uh, people who have been incarcerated or are currently incarcerated, you know, uh, people who just don't fit into our normal cultural mold, right? People who feel like a square peg getting forced into a round hole. When those people need something, those who see their faith as an expression of individual belief, they turn their back on them. They make fun of them. They they tell them to get a job. They tell them, you know, uh, if they if they uh, if they need something, work for it, right? Because they just don't want to understand, nor do they want to help, because it makes them uncomfortable to help. It makes them uncomfortable to uh, to lend a, a helping hand and. And uncomfortableness has no place in a faith guided and dominated by individualism. Now, I, I want to I want to say something. You may you may already know this if you you know if you are somebody who has been listening to our sermons for a while now, you might not be surprised by this statement. And if you're new, maybe you will be surprised by this statement. But the Bible does not promote individualism. It is not something that, that the Bible wants us to, to guide our lives by. As a matter of fact, the Bible, I would suggest, is a communal document. It's about uh, the collective uh, individual coming together, right? Uh, a bunch of different people coming together collectively for a common cause. The Bible, if you really, if you really look at it and break it down to its most basic component, it is a collection of narratives and letters, wisdom, poetry, and, and future warnings that guide us collectively, and that's the key word there, to be in relationship with God. Yes, our, we have to make individual decisions for God, but it is a collective effort to walk that journey. A matter of fact, the Bible warns us that this journey will be hard, that this faith journey will, will be difficult, and one that we cannot do alone. Why? Because God wants us to come together. His, he prayed that we would come together in John chapter 17, and as we come together, we would also then 
come to him. Salvation is found in our relationship with God, right? On an individual level. It is found in our relationship with God, but it is proven in our relationship with other people. Now, many people are not ready for the communal journey. We, we have been raised in this culture of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, get to work, and just get it done. You know, they, they, uh, you know, people who are not ready for the communal journey think that it was that they need to trek this on their own, that they need to, they need to prove their own faith to God and do not need the help of those next to them. And the only help that they quote unquote need is, you know, making sure that they are helping out at church. Well, can I tell you, it is not possible to trek the Christian journey on your own. You cannot, cannot complete the path that God has set for you on your own. You were never meant to do it on your own. So the question that I want to pose today and, and, and answer throughout our, our conversation together is how do we make sure that we are ready for this communal faith journey? Well, we're going to answer this question in three sections. And, and all of these sections will be taken look at the same chapter of scripture, Matthew chapter 25. In that chapter of scripture, uh, Jesus tells us three uh, separate parables, but yet all of them are connected to one another. In the first section, we're going to talk about the parable of the 10 virgins, and we're going to talk about how through that parable, we learn the lesson of being prepared. In our second section, we're going to talk about the parable of the bags of gold and how we need to invest our faith. We'll talk about what that looks like. And then our third section, we're going to look at my favorite parable of all time, the parable of the sheep and the goats, and how we need to care for and love others. So let's dive right into our first section by looking at the parable of the 10 virgins. Now, instead of reading uh, the story verse by verse, I want to tell the story that it was heard originally through the story telling uh, and I think to keep true to the text, we need to tell it too, all right? So here's the rundown of what happened. There are 10 virgins uh, who are about to get married to a groom, okay? Five of them have been considered wise, and five of them have been considered foolish. Before anything happens, they're already described. Five wise, five foolish. All of them waiting for the same dude. Well, the, the guy uh, doesn't show up on time. Uh, at least not when they thought he was going to show up. And so they get drowsy and they fall asleep. Well, when they fall asleep, they forget to turn down their lamps so that when they are awakened, when the groom comes, they'll have enough oil. So, of course, they hear uh, that the groom is coming down the road. So get up, get ready, you know, fix your hair, make sure everything is good to go. But before uh, the groom comes, like before he shows up, to them, the fools realized that they didn't bring any extra oil. They only had what was in the lamp. And so they know that by the time that that car gets from where it is to where they're at, they're not going to have uh, any fire in, uh, in the lamp. So they walk over to the wise, uh, the wise women and they said, hey, you have extra oil. Would you please let us have your extra oil so that our lamps uh, can be lit as well? And, of course, the five uh, wise women say, of course not, because we know that our lamps are going to burn out before he gets here. And we need to refill our lamps and relight them so that we have enough, uh, you know, we have enough uh, fire in the lamp for when the when the groom gets here. So why don't you go to the 24-hour Walmart and, and and buy yourself some oil and then come back and hopefully you get back in time, right? So that's what the uh, what the foolish women do. They go and they go to the Walmart and they go get their oil. But while they're gone, the groom goes from where he you know from being seen in the distance to right up on them, and he takes the five wise women and he brings them into uh, the wedding feast and he closes and locks the door. Now, by the time the uh, the foolish women get back, the party's already started, right? So they go to the door to let themselves in. Well, the door is locked. So what do they do? They they knock on the door, right? Knock, knock, knock. You know, uh, they knock on the door, and the groom shows up. 
He opens the door. He sees these women there, right? His other five, you know, uh, fiancés, you know, whatever, uh, sees him there and they say, let us in. And he goes, absolutely not. I'm not going to let you in because you, uh, you weren't there when I came and picked to pick you all up. I don't know who you are. You're no longer a part of the wedding party. Go get lost. We've already started. And he shuts the door on their face. Now, you know, regardless of what you think about uh, the groom and his actions, right? Uh, there is something to to learn from from this story. All right, so we're going to put aside the moral implications of more than one wife. We're going to put aside the moral implications of you know shutting doors in the face and you know misunderstandings and whatnot. Right? Let's just talk about the point of the parable. Right? And here's the point. Our faith needs to go the distance. We need to be prepared to never give up. You see, the foolish women did not want to give up. Right? They wanted to be a part of the wedding party. They just had nothing left in the tank. And isn't that true how it is for some people who leave the faith? Like They want to be Christian. They have a desire to follow Jesus. They just didn't expect it to be this hard or to take this long. Uh, and so by the time something difficult does come, they have nothing left in the tank. And they just, they just bow out. And they just don't show up anymore. And then their faith eventually just, just dies. Preparation is key to a strong faith. And it comes from a wise faith. Now, by wise, in this context, what I mean by that is being ready for anything that might come our way, right? We have to be ready for the difficulty that comes with Christianity, whether that be cultural, personal, uh, societal, whatever, right? We have to be ready for anything because we need to be able to survive uh, or have our faith survive the distance. Here's the truth. God's gift of salvation has an expiration date. If, I, if I'm here encouraging you to go the distance, and, and if you read the New Testament, that's one of the main messages of the epistles of Paul or the letters of Paul is to keep going, don't give up, because there's an end point. That infers there's a finish line, that there is a point when we get to where we say, okay, we've done it, we've gotten here, we're done. And if there is a finish line, then that means that there is a, a time limit, that those who refuse to complete the race, who don't get to finish, they don't get, they don't get the prize, right? And in this case, eternal life, right? The wedding feast in this parable is the finish line. And even though the five foolish ones came to the door, they were allowed to enter because they were too late. Now, again, you know, these parables aren't exact representations of who God is supposed to be. So don't read that into this because we know that God desires for everyone to be saved. He wants them to be saved. And we, we, we read that in the letters of the New Testament. But here's the deal. To be prepared is to not take that desire for granted. The five foolish ladies thought, well, even if we're late, who cares? As long as we get there, we're fine. That's not how it works. There's an end point. There's a finish line. And if you're not there when Jesus is ready to hand out the medals, if you're not there when he's ready to hand out the prize of eternal life, then you miss out even though he doesn't want you to. This is what I want you to hold on to as we head into our first set of discussion questions. Now, if you're new with us, these questions are going to pop up here in just a moment. You'll hit pause, and then you'll talk about either one or all three of these in about a 10 to 15 minute time frame. Okay. Now, you can either talk about this with a group of people, which I hope you are, or you can uh, quietly reflect on these individually uh, and write down your answers uh, and journal your answers or pray through your answers or whatever you want to do uh, through this, this, time, uh, this time of discussion. Okay, So take 10 to 15 minutes, answer either one or all three of these, and when you're done, come on back and we'll, set our, we'll start our second section.
Hey guys, welcome back. So glad you could uh, come uh, join us for this time of discussion. And listen, let's not forget what we just learned here, right? Our, our first section tells us that we need to be prepared, right? And, and this is true for anything. You know, when I was in college, I had an Old Testament professor who would give us these blue book essay quizzes. And that was all of his quizzes, every single one of them, blue book essay. And I loved them, not because I had the right, but because before the exam, like the day before, the week before, he would get up at the board and he would map out the exact outline that he wants us to follow for the quiz. And then we would talk through each and every one. We would ask questions and then we would, uh, we would make sure that we understood what was going to be on the quiz. Our job was to, uh, to expand based upon what we had learned throughout that semester on the topic at hand. So what? Uh, so those of us who would prepare by doing study sessions or teaching it to other people, or you know even just writing it out freehanded and uh, before uh, the essay, we passed. Those who uh, didn't, those who just said, "Well, we just went over it. I'm just going to you know forget it and just hope I you know can remember it come test day." Those people tended uh, to fail, right? And it was always beyond me how people failed this because all you had to do was prepare. So how do I make sure that that my lamp is is lit? How do I make sure that I am prepared, right? Because faith is a lot like my Old Testament teacher was, right? It, he, he puts out the exam, right? Jesus puts out the roadmap to how to get saved. He tells us that we need to prepare for this. And, and those who do... They're the ones who pass. Those who don't, they're the ones who fail. So I need to make sure that I'm prepared. Uh, you know, if I put it back to that last parable, I need to make sure that I have enough oil in my lamp to be lit. So how do I do that? How do I make sure that my faith is prepared for the long road ahead? And what does it even mean to be prepared? Well, this is what Jesus answers in the second parable of Matthew chapter 5, the parable of the bags of gold. Now, this parable starts off telling us that the business owner is about to leave town, so he divides his wealth between three employees, right? The first one receives $500,000, the second receives $200,000, and then the third, $100,000 respectfully, right? Now, the first and the second uh, uh, servant, they go take their money and they double it, right? Uh, but the third, because he's afraid of the kind of reputation that his boss has, right, uh, and and is afraid that if he loses any money, will uh, have negative repercussions from the boss. He decides to dig a hole and literally bury the money in a box in a hole in the ground. All right, and does nothing. That way, he can at least guarantee that the boss gets the money back. Well, what happens? Well, the boss comes back and he settles his accounts with his employees. Now, the first one comes in and he says, boss, you're going to be happy with me. I took your 500 thou, I doubled it, and now you got a mill. Right here it is. Take the money. So he gives them the million dollars and the boss is ecstatic. And he says, look, you have shown great responsibility. So now that I've entrusted you with a little, I'm going to trust you with a lot. Come and enjoy your master's happiness. The second one says, boss, you're going to be ecstatic. I I, uh, I took the 200 thou and I turned it into 400 thou. Here is your money. Right? So the boss takes the $400,000 and he says, man, you have done an awesome job. Right? I have trusted you with a little. Now I'm going to trust you with a lot. Come and enjoy your master's happiness. Well, the third guy comes in, the employee comes in, and he says, Boss, you're going to be ecstatic. You gave me $100,000. I didn't want to, you know, to lose any of it, and I knew that you're kind of a harsh dude, right? So, uh, so instead of investing it, I buried it in the hole. Here is all of your money. And he hands them $100,000. But the boss is ticked like he is ticked off and he says look the least you could have done the least you could have done is put it into a bank that has interest uh that can accrue some interest and you could have gave me back a thousand dollars plus the hundred dollars or so that i would have made from interest but you didn't even do that you are so stinking lazy get out of my sight you're fired. You're never allowed in this business 
again, and he kicks him out of the building. Now, what do we learn from all of this? Well, what we learn is to be prepared is to invest your faith in the kingdom of God. That's what the first and second employee did. They didn't just sit on it. They invested it and, and increased the profit. You see, the problem with the third employee was not his failure to make more money. I honestly believe that if he would have lost money on this, if he would have, you know, gambled it on a, on a bad product or taken it, you know, invested it into something crappy and, and lost all the money, yeah, I think the boss would have been mad, but I think he would have shown some grace, right? So it wasn't that he didn't do anything with it. It, or it wasn't that, I mean, it wasn't that he, uh, sorry, it wasn't that he failed to make money. It was that... He didn't do anything with it. That's the problem. He, his failure was not doing anything with what he was given. See, God has not just given us salvation. Right? It's a free gift, and I know I'm going to get a lot of you know comments on this. He hasn't given us salvation. He has entrusted us with salvation. There's a difference. And I, I want to take a look at this word entrusted because this is what the parable says that the owner did with his wealth. He entrusted it to the employees. Well, to entrust literally means to give over. It means to commit. Another uh, scholar puts it this way. It means to grant someone the opportunity or occasion to do something. These men could not have done what they did. The first and second employee could not have done what they did or had the opportunity to do what they did had they not been given that money in the first place. They needed the boss to give him his wealth. That is what entrusted means. And the business owner made it very clear that they were to do something with the wealth that they had been given. This is what it means that God has entrusted us with, uh, with his salvation, right? He has saved us and we are to do something with it. We are not to be the third employee and sit on our faith. We need to invest our faith because investing our faith is to show respect to God. Okay, so think about Isaiah uh, the prophet, right? In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is called by God into his temple. And here's Isaiah standing in the full presence of God, which would normally kill a guy. But God shows him grace by allowing him to live in his presence. And so when God, just a few moments later, asks, you know, I need somebody to volunteer to share the word of God to my people, Isaiah immediately stands up and says, here am I, I'll do it, God. But he didn't respond because he felt pressured, nor did he uh, respond because he felt scared. He wasn't obligated to do this. Isaiah responded because he was grateful. He was grateful for what God had done for him, and now he's grateful for the opportunity. If we are grateful for our salvation... We will invest our faith. It will become a natural thing. Even, and, and the response doesn't have to be huge. Because even the tiniest of responses is adequate. Remember, the, the, the boss said to the third employee, look, even if you would have just invested it in a bank and got pennies, I would have been okay with that. And our faith to keep our salvation hidden, to sit on it. It's not us being responsible. It's us being lazy. Because Christianity demands risk. It, it comes with gains and it comes with losses. We are going to try stuff that is going to fail, but we're also going to try stuff that's going to succeed. But if we don't try, we're just being lazy. And let me tell you, God hates laziness. In the book of Revelation, Jesus writes a letter to a church, a church called Laodicea. And, and he says that, uh, that I, I, I wish you were either hot or cold. I wish that you would do something that worked or something that failed. But because you're doing nothing, and he defines the nothing as being lukewarm, he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, that term literally means to regurgitate. 
So here's what Jesus is saying. He says, look, because you're not doing anything, you are literally making me sick. And I'm just going to throw you up. You are nothing more than puke. That's a harsh truth. But it's a pointed one. We cannot hold on to our faith and keep it to ourselves. We cannot keep our salvation in a closed and tight fit and keep it close to our chest. We have to do at least the bare minimum investment required to be prepared for the long journey ahead. Now, what is that bare minimum investment? That's what we're going to talk about in our third and final section. So go ahead. When the questions pop up, pause this video. Talk about the questions, either one or all three of them. Take about 10 to 15 minutes, and I'll be waiting here when you get back. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a really good conversation, especially with this last one, because it is so important that we invest our faith, but also how we invest our faith matters, right? You know, Heather and I recently, we, uh, we just bought uh, another car and uh, the way that uh, we usually buy cars is that we, we find a payment that we can afford, a monthly payment that we can afford through a loan, right? Um, and, and instead of just paying off that loan, you know, the minimum payment every month, we try to pay it off early by taking any extra money that we've had, that we have at the end of the month and just putting that on the loan. That way we can pay it off early and have ownership, full ownership of the car a lot sooner than what the term of the loan would allow us, right? Well, our faith is kind of the same. You know, we are required to do the bare minimum, just like Heather and I are required to pay the bare minimum of the car payment each and every month. We are required to do the bare minimum, but a lot more is encouraged. Now, we're going to talk about the bare minimum here, but I want to put this caveat that we need to do a lot more than this. Like we should, we shouldn't feel obligated. We should just want to. We should desire to please God the most that we possibly can. Okay, but let's talk about the bare minimum by talking about my all-time favorite parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. So here's the parable. Jesus comes back, right? And in every story, it's the same. There's one person that comes that, that comes back, right? The groom comes back, uh, the business owner comes back. Jesus comes. back back. And when he comes back, he separate, separates people into two camps, right? The righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous is symbolized by sheep and they're put off to his right. The goats are symbolized, or sorry, the unrighteous are symbolized by goats and they're put to his left. And he has a talk with each and every one of them. Now, those who provide nourishment for the hungry and the thirsty, those who befriended the stranger, those who clothed the naked, those who visited the shut end and, and, and the trouble, <coughs> excuse me, uh, those people end up being saved because, Jesus says, they saw Jesus and those who had need. Now, those who didn't do those things, those specific things that I just mentioned, are condemned for the same reason because Jesus says, <coughs> excuse me, I'll take a drink right here, real quick. Because Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of these, you do for me. One of the greatest lines in the entire New Testament, right? Whatever you do for the least of these, you need to do, you know, you whatever you do for me is what it's the same thing. So what do we mean by this? Those who care for and love others will be saved. Guys, this is the bare minimum. Okay. It, it, it's not about going to church every week. It's, it's not about going to home group. <clears throat> it's not about, uh, you know, it's not about any other moral or ethical activity. It's about caring for and loving others. This is what it means. Uh, you know, when Jesus starts off this chapter with, uh, you know, talking about being prepared, you need to be prepared. Well, how do I become prepared? The second parable tells us you need to invest your faith. Well, then how do I invest my faith? By caring by, about people, caring for people, by loving them the way Jesus loves us, right? To care for and love others is to treat them like Jesus. And since <coughs> we love Jesus, we should love others 
That's what the sheep did. They loved Jesus. They ended up loving others. It should always come naturally. Jesus tells us that if you love me, you will keep my commands. That's not a threat. That's just a lesson. What Jesus is saying here is that by loving me, you will be transformed by me and be able to keep my commands because love is what guides us to do good. It's what guides us to be better. This is the bare minimum. Now listen, the bare minimum talks nothing. This parable talks nothing about our morals, our personalities, our character flaws, whether or not we cuss too much or too little, right? Whether we lie, steal, cheat. It doesn't talk about any of this. No, the only thing that it talks about is caring for and loving other people. That is the bare minimum. All we have to do is to care for and love the law. So what does that mean? Well, to care for means to do what Jesus says in Matthew 25. It's to provide nourishment for those who are hungry and thirsty. It means to the befriend the stranger who finds himself in a new location and doesn't know what they're doing, right? It means to clothe the naked who people in the winter who don't have uh, you know, who don't have winter coats or people in the summer who are wearing you know, winter clothes and need to cool off. It means clothing those people. It means visiting the shut-in and the troubled, the lonely, people who can't get out for whatever reason they have. But it's more than just taking care of their needs. It's loving them like Jesus loves us. We need to be able to see Jesus in those that we care for. We need to love them like Jesus loves loves us. What does that mean? Well, it means we have to show grace. It means we need to show patience. Patience. It means we need to show perseverance. We need when, when somebody does something wrong that we're caring for, we need to forgive them. When somebody doesn't get what we're trying to teach, we need to keep on teaching them. When, when somebody stabs us in the back or treats us like trash or takes us for granted, we have to stick with it as long as God calls us to do it the bare minimum is caring for and loving others now we're going to go ahead and stop here and enter into our last and final discussion uh, and when we come back I want to talk about how this practically applies to us as a church okay so go ahead and pause take about 10 to 15 minutes and when you're done come on back and we'll finish things out Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, you know, look, I, I'm not really wanting to be that creative here, right? Uh, this is a standalone sermon, and 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 because it was a standalone sermon, I wanted to think, okay, what is the number one thing I want you guys to think about? And it, it turns out it's the same as the title, right? The Fed need to feed. The Fed being those who have been uh, nourished and fed by Jesus, those who are Christian, right? Those who um, who are increasing their faith and do, you know, who have enough oil, right, in their lamps, who are prepared uh, to go the long haul, who are investing their faith, who are taking care for, uh, or caring for, excuse me, and loving others. Those people are required. The bear to to at for the bare minimum to feed other people. That's it. That's the thing I want you to think of. The fed need to feed. This is why Matthew 25 is so important to me because I think that this is at the core of what it means to be a Christian. And let me tell you, this is this will be what it means for us as a church to be a church. We will care about feeding other people, about doing what others won't do. So we are going to uh, partner with ministries around Hendricks County uh, starting next year uh, that will help us uh, uh, nourish the hungry and the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit uh, the lonely, right? 
uh, and, and to do all these other things that Matthew 25 outlines for us. And, and as we get closer to the new year, you're going to see announcements about these things happening. I'm so excited about this because this is what it means to be a Christian. And let me tell you, and this is the thing, I've said this before, I've gotten in trouble for this before, at churches years and years ago, right? If all you do is sit in a pew and you hear a preacher or somebody say, whatever you do for the least of these, so you do for me. And you get up and you leave that church and you do absolutely nothing. In other words, if you're nothing but that third employee who sits on your butt and does nothing with what God has given you, then you might be a goat. And given the cultural context of the word goat, this is not that type of goat. This is not a goat that you want to be. Because sheep, the ones who invest their faith, the ones who care for and take care of other people, they got ushered into eternal life. The goats, not so lucky. They get thrown into eternal condemnation. Folks, you don't want to be a goat. You need to be different. And all you need to do to be different is to care for and love other people. And we, as a church, will be defined by how we help other people. So maybe you're sitting here and you're one of those people who need to be fed. And you want to reach out because you need some sort of help. You need somebody to talk to. You need somebody to help work through the uh, the things that you are struggling with and battling with. Give us, give us a call. Contact us. All of our information is right there on the screen. You, you can email. You can get online. You can go to Facebook, Instagram. You can get a hold of us, and we will respond to you. We'll set up an appointment, we'll talk, and we'll, we'll, we'll see where you're at spiritually and physically, and we'll see if, how, if at all, we can help. But we're not going to not try. We're going to try. Well, maybe you're even sitting there, and you're one of the fed, and you want to join us in helping us feed. Well, then, you know, let us know that. Contact us, too. Send an email. Get on social media. Share this sermon. Whatever you got to do, join us uh, on Tuesdays, either in person or online. If you want to join us in person, we meet every Tuesday night at 6.30 at Tri-West Middle School in Liston, Indiana. If you want to join us online, we kick off at 6.50, right before the conversation starts at 7. You can join us by going to online.thebridgehc.org. But whatever you do, don't just sit on it. Do something with what God has given you. And if you want what God has... Let us know too, and we will help you get it, okay? Well, I'm so glad you joined us today, and I cannot wait uh, until next week. But until then, guys, as always, peace, love, and soul.